Philip Granger and Viola Sampson. We're talking today at an early stage in the creation of an opera based on the myth of Daedalus. The libretto is finished, the music has just started. Philip, to start at the beginning, what drew you to the myth of Daedalus? Well, to go back to, I suppose, the, the earliest point um, would take me back to 1986 and uh, my honeymoon in Paphos, Cyprus, um, which was the first time I'd visited uh, anywhere uh, Greek and um, my first example of, of Greek culture um, and uh, it made a great impression on me and while I was there I got to know the work of Lawrence Durrell and read a number of books about his time uh, in Cyprus and then when I returned from there I got hold of Robert Graves' um, extensive collection of Greek myths uh, where I found the myths uh, relating to Daedalus and his son Icarus um, and I think I was drawn to them because I was, I was particularly interested at that time in, in the labyrinth uh, part of the, of the myth. And um, I'd already been interested in pulse labyrinths, uh, a technique, a device, uh, almost basically invented by Harrison Berkwistall for his piece Silbury Air in 1977. Um, and uh, whereas for Berkwistall that was more or less a one-off uh, using... Um, that particular device. I'd already started to develop um, various ways of extending uh, pulse labyrinths in, uh, in, my, in my work. And so I felt that uh, the, the labyrinth part of the, of the Daedalus myth related to that. And, um, and as a result of, of, of my interest, I wrote three pieces, um, the Dark Labyrinth in, in 1986, which is actually based on the structure of uh, a Lawrence Durrell novel, um, Preludes and Maze Dance in 1987, and my Concerto for Orchestra Labyrinthine Images, which was written in 1988, um, all based around using um, pulse labyrinths and relating to uh, the myths pertaining to the, to the labyrinth. Um, then, then, towards the end of the 1980s, I came across a couple of books by someone called Michael Ayrton, um, The Maze Maker and The Testament of Daedalus. Uh, and I, I was very taken by these books and realised through them that actually uh, the myths surrounding Daedalus would make a great subject for an opera. But uh, at the time, I couldn't proceed with that because... Uh, I, was, I, I got a job at, at Exeter um, founding the, the composition department there and I had plenty of other commissions to get on with. About 10 years later, uh, in 1999, I did write uh, a short piece called uh, Sky Maze with Song Shards, which was inspired by those Ayrton books, uh, um, and another piece in 2001 called Daedalus's Lament, um, again inspired by those books. The main thing about Ayrton was he really wasn't a, a novelist. He wasn't really a writer. He was a, he was a painter and a sculptor, and he was obsessed with the Daedalus and Icarus um, stories and did many paintings and sculptures uh, based on aspects of, of them. And uh, through all that, I, I, I started to realise this was, in a way, a story about uh, a sort of proto-scientist inventor who was so obsessed with... Uh, his work that he he never fully appreciated the the ramifications of what he what he was doing or the consequences, um, and I felt that actually there have been plenty of times in the 20th century um, where science had, had rushed off ahead without people being fully aware of what the consequences might be, and I saw some uh, very direct parallels there and thought that would make a great subject for an opera. So this is where it, where it came from, where it originated from. Fiona, when um, Philip asked you to write the libretto, um, what was it that attracted you to the subject? Well, actually, it couldn't have been more fortuitous because I've been thinking a lot about um, Frankenstein and Mary Shelley for the last two, three years because I've written a biography of Mary Shelley. And Frankenstein is, is I guess, in popular culture now, much the better known of the two myths. I mean, it is also a myth about hubris, about the overreaching maker or, or innovator and um, in one version one could say the blue sky scientist who, who doesn't think about the ethical and social consequences of, of his research, doesn't understand that all knowledge is ultimately applied 
whether you intend it to be or not. But, um, not but, and, the thing about these myths, I think both Frankenstein and Daedalus, is the longer you spend with them, the more you can turn them around in your hands and find that they speak in every direction. So then I became interested in the notion of Frankenstein as um, a kind of, as, as receiving unwarranted suspicion. That's to say of the figure of the innovator as a head of society, but not necessarily um, in some way failing society by being an innovator. In fact, being, being a sort of scapegoat figure, a kind of figure on which society fears about as well as hopes for, you know, technological solutions to climate change, for example. Insert almost any um, scientific or medical or clinical advance you can think of. Um, on which to, to carry those fears for society. And I think that's very interesting because then that means that you don't simply have um, a great mind with a, with a fatal flaw, which is the hubris. You have, uh, we were talking about characterization in opera yes, earlier today, you have this multifaceted individual who's as a kind of push me pull you, which is always great for, for drama, for tension, for a, a propulsion which is deeper than the narrative um, between what he can know, what he could do, and what the consequences will be, the personal consequences as well as the moral conse consequences and the consequences for the society around him. So I think that all that's very interesting. And reading the two myths side by side, what's really interesting is that Frankenstein is an all at once myth, you know, made by Mary Shelley. Okay, there's a founding myth about the writing of Frankenstein, which is that it's summer 1816, she and Byron and Percy Shelley and Polidori who wrote vampire, the first vampire story, are reading ghost stories, and then Mary says there was also a conversation about, between this community of radical atheists about what, after the death of God, is, this, is the infusing spirit of life, what's the animating thing, and could, could humans recreate that or create that? Um, but, you know, it's a novel. She writes it within a year, she has the idea, and she executes it, and it's the work of one hand, despite rumours about Percy's interventions, which are disproved by the manuscript, as it happens in parentheses. Whereas Daedalus is, is, a, is a socially originated myth, that's to say it's, it had quite a long period of oral transmission too, and so there are quite a lot of versions, and there's a kind of straggle, or, or perhaps radial version of it, where there are variants. So not every account has um, the death of Talos, the apprentice, who is the kind of proto-son who faces off against Icarus, but some do. Some have an account in which um, Daedalus kills Talos out of envy, and some it's more accidental, or the kind of shedding of Talos. Um, Daedalus um, is supposed to have done all sorts of things. He's supposed to be the first blacksmith. He invents steel, so he armors the senior armies. So that's obviously death dealing. But he also is supposed to have created automata, which he brings to sort of to life, perhaps not quite really to, as it were, authentic life in the same sense as Frankenstein's creature. But then in the debate about AI, we don't know what authentic life is anymore, do we? Um, what makes a thinking thing, even? Um, he's person have done all sorts of things like invented the first saw and so on. He's become the, the Daedalus means cunning, but it also means, and wrought, but it also means the maker. So he's in a sense, not a scapegoat, but he's the figure of the maker. And in fact, it's interesting that in, in Balkans, Balkan traditions, there's a thing called the Dodala, which is actually they're girls, they're virgins, but they are, they are, they're rainmakers, they're crop makers. They go out into the crops and so on. So obviously that certain notion of just the maker, what is making, what is adding to the sum of things in the world. And that then is very interesting for anyone who is a maker, whether they're a writer or a composer. You know, it's a way to think about the kind of loneliness of going out beyond what's been thought before. You know, Eliot said poetry is a raid on the inarticulate. So going out beyond what you think you can invent or what you've, you know, already read and, and absorbed in the culture is, is interesting, but it also does feel risky. So all these things are really interesting about Daedalus. And beyond that, actually, it's interesting, there is, of course, the Finnish myth, too, in Kalevala. There's Ilmarinen, who is a god, not a man, so it is different, but he's a blacksmith. 
and he creates a wife for himself. So it's a variant. And quite clearly, I think in that variation, you have a sense much more of our fear of the maker. The maker is that their powers are somehow occult and therefore sort of intrinsically to be feared. Whereas with Daedalus, it's much more one feels that Icarus is a sacrifice that he has to pay to, not to society, but to the gods. You know, the gods are punishing him for overreaching. So the makerliness is, is human and is a human step too far. And then Frankenstein contracting back again from that, it's simply you're prepared to risk um, other human beings and uh, another creature, because there's a parallel story in Frankenstein. So there's a kind of retraction in the free versions of the power and, and, the, and the, the degree to which that power is magical and occult. But reading them side by side is hugely interesting. It just allows you to go deeper and deeper. Now, Philip, um, what do you need from a libretto? Um, well, I think what I needed for, from this libretto um, was uh, first and foremost structure, because as, as Fiona has mentioned, um, there are quite a few myths and versions of myths, and uh, they sort of they're quite straggly. And and of course, one of the reasons for that is is, is these myths go back before Greek times. The Greeks appropriated uh, these myths from Minoan culture, so they may well go back to around three thousand five hundred BC. Um, and uh, what I needed the libretto to do first was create a dramatic structure that would focus uh, on important elements of them and create a dramatic narrative that you know would would work. Um, I got plenty of ideas, but but they were all over the all over the place. Really, you know, they weren't in any coherent um, s structural form. So that was the first thing um, I think that Fiona set, set about doing and, and created. Um, I, I, there was something that's very specific to this project, which was that um, it had to be multilingual because that's uh, it was involved in, in the, you know evolved out of the Aori uh, initiative, um, and that required it to be multilingual. And in the first instance, um, I was quite happy to do that because what I'd envisage was something where uh, Daedalus would swap to ancient Greek at moments of, of real extremis, the, like when he loses Icarus. Um, and it wouldn't matter that we couldn't understand the words uh, specifically, uh, necessarily, um, because the music would convey the, the emotion anyway. But in fact, as I'm sure uh, Fiona will explain, she, she developed a much more sophisticated um, approach to a whole range of non-English languages being included. Um, so that was great. Um, and I needed a libretto that was two contradictory things. One, I wanted it to be um, formal and rigorous and well-constructed. And at the same time, completely flexible <laughs> and something that I could manipulate as the music requires. Because I think what happens when you're, when you're setting words is that you, you start thinking, oh, these are the words, I will set them. But the music itself contains a life of its own that um, works in counterpoint to the, to the words. So at some points, it will simply back them up. But at other points, it may completely contradict them or require them to do things that are, are not what we would want in everyday language or what we would need in everyday day language. So I needed a libretto that would allow me that. And also, um, Fiona mentioned characterization. I'm very, I was very keen that, that the opera would be about what motivates these characters, what, what makes them act the way they do, because I think that's the most important thing about opera, to be quite honest, is that we see on the stage aspects of human nature, and um, that's obviously where, um, you know, Greek drama started from, you know, it was the community coming together to see aspects of, of themselves being writ large on the stage, you know. Um, so I, I, I very much wanted characters that I could uh, make very 3D, that, who would have flaws that weren't just um, ciphers for, for things like hubris, 
there's a reason why Daedalus ends up in that position. Um, it is to do with certain amount of external circumstances, but it's also to do with flaws in his own character, which are also strengths. You know, he, he has these abilities, um, but I, I'm quite keen to convey him as those abilities are very uh, prevalent on the surface. Underneath, there's quite a lot of doubt about his own abilities. And because he's forever trying to shut out the doubt, he comes across as perhaps more bombastic or more full of himself than he really is. Um, I like that sort of that sort of characterization because um, it has depth about it. You know, it feels really human. So those are all the things I wanted from this this libretto, um, and I think I've been supplied with. So that's great. <laughs> Fiona, what what attracted you to write a libretto? Oh well, I've always wanted to write a libretto. <laughs> Because I used to be a musician and because I'm very interested, therefore, in how words and music sit together. Um, because I really like certain contemporary operas and because I was quite involved in the writing, in, in being sort of the first reader, the, the sounding board for ideas for, for example, the libretto for the Minotaur. Um, and uh, because I think a libretto can be really badly done. And... Uh, I think there are lots of problems to solve and because it just stretches my poetry practice in a different way. I think a libretto, yeah, I mean everything that Philip was saying really, I think that it has to be, I said yesterday in Armature, it has to be this little sort of wire frame which has a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of map, a kind of a set of touchstones of certainty, a structure, an organisation on which the composer builds the composition. But the composition that the composer builds is not necessarily going to exactly mirror the armature. It's like, you know, those sort of 1930s Picasso sculptures where he's put little stick women inside, you know, so, you know, pen people, inside like a figure of a head and so on. So the armature can be in a way quite secret. It can, but it's done its work. Um, and I also believe strongly that the more formed, not necessarily the, the stricter the form, but the more uh, completely formed, the more completely achieved a text is, the more space it opens up. Partly because it's just doing itself well, but partly because it offers resources, in the case of poetry, rhythmic and musical, linguistic music, musical resources, which the composer then can then use or ignore. But it offers more possibilities by being formal. And also because I think it's good to make something that's well made and complete, even though it will be then pulled apart and so on in, um, in the process of composition. And I think that uh, some things that are particularly important in libretto are, you know, there's a lot of agonising among poets. Oh, well, you know, poetry has its own music. It's already set to its own music. How can you set it to music? So I think when you write for, it, it's slightly different. And, but, but besides poems can be set but it's just that they are recreated in the setting they are they are transformed by the setting the setting doesn't simply supply something that the poem already had or it would be tautological it would be kind of eliminating that aspect from the poem it, it, it supplies its own thing it's a new form of remaking um, but I do think that libretti need to be not too cluttered with words. I, need they, I think they do need to remember the importance of vowels as the, as the spoken and particularly the sung part of the word and therefore assonance is incredibly important as a kind of linking that's not absolutely systematic but is, is deeply there, characterises each speech or each you know, stanza or whatever. I was also very interested in um, using speech rhythms but uh, regularly stressed lines because again I think that allows all sorts of rhythms to be uh, to to occur in the music, and it doesn't distort the language, so you don't get awful archaisms or kind of wrenched. All the language should work with freshness and clarity, but um, nevertheless have a formal integrity. That's it. It seems like the most innocent of forms, but actually, in a way, perhaps one of the most difficult. And then finally, I was interested in it being not a costume drama where everyone's wearing, you know, their white tunics and having laurel wreaths in their hair. But then I didn't also want to do one of those awful uh, kind of let's 
translated into it being about AI and so on, because otherwise people can't understand the issues. You know, I wanted it to do both. So I, I wanted to have depth charges of resonance. So um, when Daedalus leaves um, Athens because of the death of Talos, whether or not it's is his fault, and, and goes to Crete, he, he, he's a refugee. He goes with Icarus and they're refugees and they're refugees, just like the migrants crossing the Med now. So that, you know, on the one hand, it's a boat which can be an any other kind of boat, but it's also um, an inflatable dinghy. You know, it, it's sort of both. There's a kind of oscillation. And Daedalus's hubris, when it is, when he is accused of it, is, is partly in, in terms of being a contemporary scientist now, but it's also partly in, 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 in much more, um, uh, not ac anachronistic, but in kind of not specifically contemporary, not so narrow as to be contemporary terms. So I was, I was trying to have that oscillation all the time because I think there's a kind of complicity. It, it implicates the audience if you could actually be there. Otherwise, it's just in fancy dress and you can choose not even really to engage. I mean, hopefully you do because the music is amazing and the performances are amazing, but uh, I just think a little bit of destabilization is good. And I also think a little bit of irrationality is extremely important in any creative work. You know, it shouldn't be systematic. It shouldn't be. A poem shouldn't be something which tells you what someone might put in a Facebook post, for example, about Brexit. It should be, it should be, tell the whole truth, but tell it slant, as Emily Dickinson said. So um, a little bit of inconsistency, a little bit of mixing it up is, I think, good for that. I'm interested in just picking up on what you were saying about Deedless, uh, mm. because it's, um, you talked about it as someone who is, Sometimes um, he's created something and at the same time he's hiding the fact of his responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. But there's also presumably the aspect of there are things that he can't foresee. That yes, is. and there are things that he's forced to do. So, for example, yeah. you know, creating the artificial cow, which is how Pasiphae, you know, mates with the sacred bull, you know, in our version, he's forced to do that, Pasiphae. And he's also forced by Minos to invent the labyrinth to contain the consequences of his ideas. So obviously he didn't think through the consequences, but also it wasn't, it, like circumstance, it wasn't voluntary because they were commands. So yes, he's certainly very far from omniscient. He's just a very talented bloke. But the, the result of that is that the demands on him are extraordinary. So he's sort of, he's an ordinary person with extraordinary abilities and extraordinary consequences from them. But yes, there's, I mean, and that, you know, that sense you always have in Greek myth of Greek drama of, you know, like poor old Oedipus, you know, who doesn't mean to kill his father and marry his mother, but nevertheless must still be punished. Mm -hmm. You know, some of um, Daedalus's offences against the gods, I mean, notably building the artificial cow, are, are, are involuntary. And they're not as involuntary as Oedipus in the sense he doesn't know, but they're involuntary in the sense he's forced, because otherwise they will be basically he and... Icarus will basically be killed, they'll be expelled. So, um, but he's still punished by the gods, you know, he still loses Icarus. So, you know, it's that, that, that wonderful sense that the Greek drama gives us, Greek tragedy gives us that, you know, on the one hand, the gods are not mocked, but, but that despite our best intentions, we poor mortals are kind of, we're in this little sphere of understanding but the great wheels of the universe are turning around us and, and soon what if they'll crush us anyway. And that instead of that awful kind of, you know, hippie notion of karma where, I mean, and I mean it in the hippie notion, not the, you know, multicultural notion that, you know, oh, well, we're comfortable in the West because we were good in, we somehow deserve it. You know, that sense that the, you know, the destiny is the deus ex machina. It does come in and and cut across our little human plans and so on. And if you don't have some sense of that scale of meaning in, in your artwork, in your opera, I mean, that, that would be a loss, wouldn't it? Mm, absolutely. I mean, opera is a big scale thing, isn't it? Uh, it is. I mean, although this, um, we're going for relatively small forces of just four singers uh, and 13 instrumentalists and four dancers as well. Uh, we are talking of a work of about an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and a half, so yeah, it is, mm. it is large scale, yes. Mm. Yeah. And it needs that sense of um, depth, I think, in order to sustain a work like that, of that length. Mm. You know. Yes, absolutely. It's a classic three-act structure, you know. So, so how has this collaboration progressed um, from your original 
first conversations? And what did you first talk about? And I think we talked through the myths initially. Um, we also talked about quite a lot about you know music we both liked actually. That's true, and poetry, and poetry we, both, exactly. we both liked, and and operas we both liked. Oh, operas we both liked. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. which was actually incredibly useful because. Well, it became apparent to me immediately, I kind of, I don't mean I knew what Philip was doing, but I knew that I liked what he was doing and I felt very comfortable with the whole, yeah, I felt like, yes, this is a kind of opera I'd love to be writing a libretto for. Whereas if you'd been into, oh, I don't know, I mean, other kinds of music, let's not go any further than that, I would have felt, oh, okay, I'll still do this, this will be interesting, but I wouldn't have felt so engaged, I wouldn't have felt, okay, this is really something where we can really do something. I mean, one of the, the greater, uh, things that um, I found with Fiona is that, of course, you you were a trained musician, mm. um, so your your first degrees are, are in music, um, and I found that I could describe, say, some of the scenes and 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 say the music's going to do this. This mm. is what I envisage, mm. um, and then then you wrote the words. Mm. Um, did, was that helpful? Yeah, very. Yes, absolutely lovely. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, of course I want to know. I mean, I also want to know, you know, it was so great to see the score on, you know, on the PowerPoint yesterday. I mean, of course I want to know what you're doing with everything. And, and I really like it when you email and say, oh, well, you know, I've, I, it was so great when you said, oh, I've, I've decided to bring in E-flat clarinet and trumpet. I said, yes, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful. And actually, that's one of the really nice things that I feel that um, it's not just, okay, I've done this and it, it goes off and goes into another room with the composer, but that it's going to be inordinately interesting all through because I care about music, you know, and, and it'll be interesting talking too and, and maybe changing things as, as you know, in the libretto as, as you go through, not just you changing things, but if you need, we've talked about this, whether if Philip needs, you know, a bit more length or a bit less length, not just that who says what when may change, but that I might write different, I might write changes in for yeah. you as well. Yeah, well, so it, it, it's, it's still a, a very much a, a collaborative process, mm. um, and I am writing every so often to say, yeah, I'm doing this, um, is that okay, mm. or this is how I'm... In the, um, we do have slightly different mm. um, ideas about how, how sections were going to go, mm. um, and uh, we've been discussing the, the, the characterization a lot recently, because mm. I think we have slightly different ideas yes. about, about that. Um, but I'm, I'm finding that really useful because uh, even if in the end I'm not doing what you said, mm. it's made me think, oh, perhaps I, I should, should be doing this differently. And even though you explained that passage yesterday, which mm. I put on, on the PowerPoint mm. to me, uh, what you were envisaging, I thought about it afterwards and I thought, no, I still agree with yeah. what I've done. Yeah. Uh, you know. yeah. that, uh, just to bring that back, that was, that was the scene about when Deedless is confronted with the death of Talos and the chorus mm. is asking, is, Accusing him of various things. They're, they're acute. Yes, they're asking him why is he dead if you were his protector, you know. And uh, and there's this passage where he sort of enunciates who he is, um, and they are in, interrupting him in, in the libretto as, as Fiona gave it to me. But instead of interruption, what I've done is is superimpose those two things, um, so that in the background they are almost chanting in a menacingly very quiet way, uh, you know, Talos is dead, the boy is, the beautiful boy is dead, you know, that sort of thing, um, out of synchronisation with each other, uh, sort of menacing around him. While he, he goes on about, well, Talos was my, my brother's son, you know, he should have been mine, but he was my apprentice. He's, he's, and he's sort of doing that both to the chorus and to the audience, um, and almost justifying himself both to them and to us. Um, and that, that's slightly different to, I think, the way you were envisaging mm. that. But I, I went through it again after we had that discussion. Yes. I still, no, still yeah. agree with the way I've done it, uh, which is quite interesting. Yes. And, it, and it's also great for me that the libretto accommodates that. Yes. I, I mean, I like it. I mean, I would like it not to be overdetermined. I'd like it to have enough depth in it that you can do that with it. And not only just do it in terms of the, the setting, the actual, as it were, um, bring the life of it, but also do it in the sense of interpreting it by that. I think that I think that's great, I, you know, because because the myth is open to many interpretations, of course, and so should well, so should the so should the libretto be. I mean, that's what I meant when I said I wanted a, a libretto that was both sort of quite rigorous 
you know, rigorously constructed, rigorously thought out, and completely flexible in mm. a way. And actually, that was a mm. moment where it, it was exactly that. Mm. Um, I think trust is quite important too. I mean, I trust Philip uh, because I really like his work and so on. And so I know he's not going to be gimmicky. I know he's going to do something for the reasons that, for reasons that I'm going to like, even if I, I disagree about the <laughs> characterization. And that's fine. That seems to be healthy. Well, you hadn't thought of it that way. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. And I mean, there, there are plenty of things that Fiona's introduced into the, into the piece, like the idea of them being refugees, mm. which had never occurred to me and which I just adored. I thought that was mm. a moment of genius because that brought in the non-English uh, elements in, into the libretto in a way that I thought was really quite sophisticated mm. and uh, had many contemporary resonances, um, you know, to do with uh, alienation and uh, otherness, which are going to affect the music. So, um, although I haven't completely decided on it, I'm still interested in this idea of using Vuvuzelas as the, for the for the royal fan, fanfares because. That idea of otherness is something that those instruments would give because they're mm. completely out of what you would normally have in, in you know, a, a Western classical ensemble. And they have a sort of raucous, raw, atavistic quality. And that's come out of, of, of thinking about the text, not in terms of specifics, but you know, thinking, oh, right, this situation has been set up where they are trying to adapt to a situation which is involving the other, you know, a society outside of their, nor their normal sort of um, uh, realm of reference. Um, and they, they adapt to it differently. So this is the other thing that uh, Daedalus, as the, the elder of the two, relies on his talents to get him by. Mm. Whereas Icarus actually really does start to integrate himself into... Icarus is a people person, isn't yes, he? Yes, yes. His, yes. Well, he doesn't have his father's no. abilities, so he, he, he takes an alternative uh, approach and tries to integrate himself into, into Cretan society, um, which I think is great and gives me so much scope, for, you know, musically. Yeah, and the other thing that was, I think it's been really interesting for me so far is that, you know, this notion that a formal constraint is actually an opportunity, and um, the, there were two really quite striking ones. One was that there was going to be dance, from the outset, and the other was the, it's got to be multilingual. I mean, it's part of the Ari project, both because of the question of translation between music and words, and because of heteroglossia. I mean, it's doubly about translation, isn't it? And um, both of those, I wanted to be non-arbitrary and non-decorative. And so actually, it's been great because the dance is, is part of the narrative structure now. First, because it, I, something I completely didn't know, but of course Philip being very embedded in the myth knew that, you know, in some versions, early versions of the myth of the labyrinth, there's a possibility that the labyrinth is actually a dancing ground, so it's actually, it's a right rather than a physical constraint. Um, and so uh, dance becomes the way that, the, that Daedalus invents the labyrinth is by observing the ritual dance. And then dance is also the flight of the birds and the way that Daedalus invents the wings and escape. So the second migration, the second time they're refugees as they leave Crete is, again, he observes the dance of the birds and then he thinks, aha, and he you know, invents wings. So, so both times the dance moves the narrative forward, it moves the action forward, but it's also part of the whole sort of colour world of, of Crete and there's this court which is um, very stratified. So, there are, so we use language for that as well. So there are locals who speak Cretan dialect. There are um, uh, courtiers who speak ancient Greek because there's something hieratic about their role. And then there's modern Greek, which is the kind of speech of the privileged, which is, in practice is the king and queen when they're being king and queen, when they're being principals. Um, so that language demarks class as well as very much, as Philip was saying, the otherness experience, you know, it's experiential, we with the refugee, Daedalus and Icarus, arrive and are greeted with the otherness of, of other languages. Um, also the birds mark out the flight by speaking in other languages. And I also wanted the, the other languages to be incorporated into the opera. That's to say, I wanted them to not need translation, but I didn't as Philip had envisaged for the, when it was going to be Daedalus' Lament, 
fall back on, oh, well, the music will be terribly expressive and they'll do it all for me. I thought, well, libretto's got to solve its own problems. So all the things that people say in other languages or sing in other languages, either by the context or because, or because they repeat something that's just been said, sung in English, you know literally what they say. Um, so, that, so that it's all... So that the libretto kind of takes responsibility for itself as a freestanding thing, even though the thing it becomes within the opera will be very, very changed. And I think that's a, a useful model for being sort of the chronologically first person in the partnership. Yeah. So, so in these first conversations, you decided, you, you knew what the sort of context of the commission was, you knew it was going to be a three-act opera, you knew the dance was going to be involved, you knew it was going to be multilingual. Mm. But a number of these other things came during the Absolutely. process of creation. Yes. Yeah. We had several meetings where we just literally talked through. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were like um, just thinking off the top of our heads about, mm. about like, for instance, the inclusion of, of, of non-English languages. What would that mean? How could we do And we were thinking mm. of other examples, what we liked, what we mm. didn't like, you know, what worked, what didn't work. I think the thing was that fundamentally below that was this idea that they couldn't be arbitrary. Neither, yes. of, neither of us wanted that. Um, we didn't want some sort of fancy gloss, superficial mm. reason for including them. They, and I think deep down whatever um, differences we might have in, in viewpoint, that's our whole approach to yeah. our craft actually. Yeah. That actually, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in things having a, a deep meaning and, and, a, and a deep down reason for hap mm. happening. We, they might disagree about what result that is, mm. but I think so, so fundamentally yeah. there's quite a connection there. Mm. Um, uh, and I think that's been really useful. Yes. You know? And I've certainly learnt a lot from that. I mean, I think one can say, without naming names, that there was a, a point at which there was one production company who we talked to who said, oh, but why, I, I, I'm not feeling this, why, why would you have this now? As if a myth didn't as if unable to understand that a myth speaks to all of us all the time, that's kind of what makes it a myth, that's why archetypes are archetypes. And that was obviously very much led from the surface backwards, so wanted probably, I don't know because I don't think they suggested, but wanted, as it were, I don't know, a figure from popular culture, I don't mean, you know, to be actually em employed on the project, but I mean, you know, to be represented, or um, wanted probably a, a, a sort of stuff that was very much to do with, didn't make you just think about AI, but was, you know, I don't know, singers pretending to be robots or whatever. I mean, very sort of scene dressing with the contemporary, rather than starting from the roots of the thing, which is the myth, and, and how does it work, and how does it work for us now. And, and building it out from there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He didn't like art music either. He wanted a musical. Really. Yeah, he did really. Yeah. Yes. Yes, but that sounds like someone else who had a different project. He wanted yeah, somebody to execute yeah, that yeah, project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Receiving your project. Mm. Yes. yes. <laughs> and the other question is did you have decisions about voice types and ensemble types early on, or did that? I developed rather gave yes, <laughs> I, I rather gave those. Yes, you did. It was another of those, those creative constraints. <clears throat> I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid I, I rather made those, but you didn't didn't question them at all. No, 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 because um, it's a chamber opera. I mean, those seemed like the right forces. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the first thing is, you know, Daedalus is a bass, which um, is an unusual voice type, perhaps, to use for your main protagonist. Although, thanks to John Tomlinson, we are now getting operas like mm. the Minotaur that feature, you know, the bass voice. I think the bass voice is an interesting voice type. Um, but because uh, my son is a bass, so I've got to know what the issues are with writing for that, that voice type. Um, because it has a huge range, actually, uh, a, very, a very wide range. Um, and it doesn't carry the, um, the heroic connotations of tenors, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's, it, it is something that's specific, that the, the current um, liking for bass baritone I think is like you end up with a voice type that's neither one thing nor the other, you know. Uh, and I want it to be this, this, this is definitely this. And 
I mean, it's, it, it may sound very simplistic. There's a depth about the voice type, because of course, you know, it's a bass that I think is very interesting. And there are lots of things that can be done with a bass because people just haven't explored that, that voice type um, very much. So, so I started from there. So if, if, I, if I have three male characters and Daedalus is the, is the bass, then for me, Icarus became a tenor. Yes. Um, you know, and therefore King Minus will be the baritone. Um, but a real baritone, not someone who tries to pretend that they've got a lower extension um, and you end up with this sort of pantomime type, mm. voice type, a real, a real baritone. And then uh, Pacify is, is a mezzo-soprano. It, it's interesting because what then I didn't anticipate, because one of the things that, that Fiona did was um, come up with the idea of all four of them would then be the chorus as mm. well. Um, is that I've ended up with, when they sing all together, of course, four voices, <laughs> three voices down there, and then one slightly higher. Yeah, I mean, which, all, the, all the voices end up being relatively low. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. Yes. And I've had to think very carefully then about what, what the harmony is and how I, um, you know, what, put the, in terms of register where I, where I put them. Um, but it's creating a very distinctive sound, mm, which I was bet, something... Yes that I hadn't anticipated, but actually is, is really quite interesting. And um, one of the things that I, I really want uh, in the music is a sense of atavism. So this is partly why the E-flat clarinet and, the, and the, the trombone have come in, because they can be used in ways that make them uh, that sound very atavistic. Um, and they're, adding, they're joining what the rest of the instruments? Uh, the rest of the instruments, so we have um, uh, flute and oboe, uh, trumpet and, and horn, one percussionist, harp, very important um, that we have harp rather than piano, mm. and then five strings. Um, so it's very tourable, you know, mm. take a, you don't have to worry about a piano being available and all that sort of thing. But also, those, are, those original instruments were all chosen, particularly the, the wind ones, be, because of course they had counterparts in antiquity. Um, and, and that's why I'd missed out the clarinet. But in fact, there's a, there's a sense of atavism about certain types of clarinet, like the E-flat, that actually proved very useful. Yeah. And in fact, the chorus is quite fiddly to write for, too, because, um, because the principles are the chorus, and they have to sometimes have to step out and then step back into the chorus. Um, so, I mean... My provisional imagination is a kind of unmasking that everyone wears a, the same sort of choral mask when they're when all four of them, and, and then they sort of take it off and step forward, as it were. I mean, it might not be as mannered as that, but that was my provisional. So, of course, you've got to make sure that the other. So, chorus one is a surprise, it's a mezzo, and so on. So chorus four is a bass, and so you've got to make sure you've got the right members of the chorus. If there are chorus solos and there's someone in character as a principal. Um, and you've also got to make sure you've got enough people in the chorus for the chorus to be a chorus. I mean, it's all right in terms of staging, because, of course, there are the four dancers as well. So they kind of add body, uh -huh. but they don't add sound, unless you're going to make non-specialists kind of, I don't know, not sing, but, you know, make noises of some kind. But, so, you know, no, I don't think yeah. we would do and, and, and dancers don't no. quite <laughs> no. like speaking either. No. So. no. Yeah. So, you know, so, so there, there was that as well, because I thought the chorus was really important because, because they are society, they are the counterbalance to these individual struggles, and, and also because just Greek chorus is a really, it's a really significant trope for Greek tragedy. So, mm. You mentioned already a little bit about how the languages have been incorporated. I uh, just wonder if you might be going a bit more detail about how these, where, where the languages are used in different parts of the opera. You said about the social uses of them, yes. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes they also are used in characterization. So a really, a really obvious example is when Icarus and Daedalus have arrived in Crete and in Act Two, um, Icarus is beginning to socialize, beginning to fit in. And he does that through learning some of the local dances by imitation dance music obviously which is great for um, which is does several things it obviously introduces the notion that Crete is really dance is really important to the way the society and the court are organized um, it also acts out shows has a way to act out Icarus becoming becoming as it were Cretan or taking on local customs 
<laughs> but how it works linguistically is that people don't say anything very interesting. They say something like left, 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 right, right, left, left, right, right, or whatever. But they say it in, first they say it in English so we can understand, and Icarus repeats it in English, and then we get it in Cretan, and then gradually he learns to say it in Cretan, and then he gradually learns to say other things like, like this, like this. And, you know, and he, he's saying those in English, and then he's saying them in Cretan dialect. So he's taking on the language. So it's very, it's, it's very non-arbitrary. It's not a kind of, now we've put a different colour lens in. It's um, language acquisition. So, in fact, what he says, what any of the characters say in, um, particularly Cretan, but also to some extent in, in modern Greek, is not very complicated. But one hopes it's sophisticated in the way it's used. It's not very complicated because otherwise our understanding would have to remember too much so that people start in English and then they move into the the other language, the language which represents their social group or their otherness or whatever. And then they come back again. Partly because as a poet, I do think that, I do think it matters what words are set. And therefore I do think that ultimately it matters that we know what the poetry of the libretto is. Not because it's mine, but because I think that's important. I don't think it's the case that it doesn't matter what the words are, it just matters that there are some words, you know. Mm. I, I think it's very important, which is why I'm a fan in contemporary opera of surtitles, because I want to see this new libretto, I want to see the poetry. So, I mean, I want to know it, and I can't, I can't, you know, hear it all. If I was reading the score, I would get it, you know. Um, so, yes. I think there's also, on well, the surtitling thing, or well, this is a bit of a digression, there's historically how important libretti were because they were actually published and people would big... actually read the libretti and read the libretto before they went to the opera in the first place. Exactly. It wasn't merely a sort of blur of vowel sounds. I mean, no. they were. People, no. prepared. People yes. prepared in advance. Exactly. It was an important yeah. thing to do. I think it's the composer's job also to make the words um, audible. Mm. I, you know, I don't go with this idea that, oh, it's opera, therefore uh, the singers will distort the words anyway and therefore you won't be able to hear them. The best singers do not do no, that. Do. No. When you go to Minotaur, you can hear everything that John Tomlinson says. Yes. And it feels like it's right in front of you. And, yeah. and uh, that's how it should be, I think. So, um, in a way, I, I, I don't think subtitles should be necessary because if everybody's doing their job properly, including the composer, the words should be audible. Mm, that's true. They should be audible, but I think the interesting thing is, is that you see, when you read it, you see it in a different way and you see it as poetry. In yes. a way that but that's for b before you go and after you have been. Mm -hmm. I think the, act, the, the, the actual performance is... It would, otherwise, it would be like going and reading the score. And, yes. which, and I don't see the point in, no. in doing that. <laughs> they, they do, but I think that, that, that's a terrible thing to do. I mean, the whole point is there are also visual things, you know, the sets, the lighting, mm -hmm. all these things are part of what makes an opera. Mm -hmm. And, of course, yes. how, how the production... Works, you know, and that's where the composition might have to, or you know, be flexible because mm -hmm. things may have to change on, on because of the staging, etc. So, um, so I think you should, one should go with nothing distracting you from from what's in front of you, personally. Mm -hmm. As a composer, um, what's your approach to setting a text which is not in your native tongue? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I do have some experience of this, and this also fed in, in a way, into, into the opera. Um, back in 1983, I, I wrote a piece called The Kingdom of Bones, which was a music theatre piece, which I had always hoped would be a stepping stone to writing an opera, and here we are 30-odd years later, and it is at last. Um, and for that piece, I set a text in Russian. So um, I think it's very important that uh, the words, no matter what language they are in, make sense. Um, you know, I can't just treat it as a load of syllables that it doesn't really matter if I don't get it right or, or, or not. I think it's important that it is right. So uh, I spent three years learning Russian. Um, I didn't master the language, but I learned it enough to be able to understand uh, it grammatically and what the issues with the language were. Um, and then I, for that particular piece, I'd use someone who, um, to write the words who, who was a, a Russian speaker and she could translate the English text that she wrote and transliterate it as well. That was really important for the person who was learning to sing it. 
and she also uh, arranged for two different speakers to speak it, to record it, you know, speak it onto tape, um, which I found very useful. One was a native Russian speaker, and the other was a Czech lady who spoke Russian. Um, and the Czech lady was very easy to understand, and the, and the Russian lady was not, because she elided a lot of the words together. But that in itself was very useful, because it gave me a great sense of... You don't just want to know how individual words are, because, and where their stress is, etc. You need to know also how, how the whole sentence, how a, a group of words work. Um, and there may be a, a very natural way that the line would you know, lilt or, or whatever. Um, and, and there might be a stress within the line as well as stresses within individual words. And if that stress changes, that might mean something. And you need to know all that. I, as far as I'm concerned, you need to know all that. Um, so uh, f I've transferred that sort of methodology to, um, to the opera, uh, or will transfer all that methodology to the opera. So we're getting the, the lines translated. Um, I will want native speakers to speak them onto or recording, so that I can hear what they what they sound. I have learned some Greek, not as much as I would like. I find the older I get, the harder it is to take in new languages. But I, I've learned enough to know sort of what the issues are. And with with the Kingdom of Bones, I, I also studied um, scores by Shostakovich to see how he set Russian, particularly uh, Yevtushenko. Um, and uh, with this opera, I'm looking at a lot of Sinakis to see what he does with Greek. Um, obviously, he was a native Greek speaker, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see the sorts of, sort of uh, things that he, he does with the language. So that's, that's the, the approach I'm taking. Um, for me, it's not a, just a sort of sound, and it's exotic or whatever. Um, it may be that, but that's just the surface. I want it to make sense, um, so that if you were someone who came from Crete or from Greece or whatever, yeah, you'd recognise it and mm. it would be correct. Because we, because I cottoned on to the fact that you were really interested in making it sound very atavistic and that's something that really excites me too. And um, I, I'm really interested in Collo because I really just, I just love Seven Time. I just love the disruption of it. And... And I like the way it's fully incorporated into sort of Balkan society, so it's not something that's brought out for tourists. I mean, of course they have national troops who do it, but it's simply it's something that people get up and do on maybe like um, at a party. And, and it's absolutely normal to have folk music often still played by, you know, two or three Roman musicians who are tipped in the traditional way with, you know, money under the keyboard and so on, mm. and who do all those things that you get in Bart up with, the slow swagger and then the um, slow virtuosic swagger and then the very fast. And there's a kind of graininess to the way that it's not sweet, it's not twee, it's just something that people do, and people know it, and that just seems like that too... Two steps forward, one back, two forward, and one back. It's so, um, well, it's so forward and back, forward and back, and kind of the cycle of life stuff that, that's one of the ideas in the, in the opera. And then also this, what I was saying yesterday about the way that form of labyrinth, it's, it's you know, you go right up, it looks like you've got to the centre straight away, but then you're, then you're pushed to the furthest away and you keep going nearer and the fur, near, closer you are to the centre, actually the further you'll be pushed back. I mean, it's a very... It's a very interesting form. It's a little parable in itself, I think, labyrinth. It's not just, it takes a long time to get to the centre, but it's this forward and back in the labyrinth. Um, and all of that's part of Collo. And that it can be fast and slow, and it can be... Yeah, and you sent me some uh, YouTube links mm. to uh, music of, of the mm. area. And, uh, it's, it's kind of screaming clarinets. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I love me. Yeah. Like that, you know, the, 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 you know, the bulk of the kind of... The, the folk clarinet is really raucous and screamy. It's fantastic sound. And the microtones in the singing. Mm, absolutely. Sort of, and it's something I'm question? thinking of using as a way of demarcating a sort of the other, as it were. So, so that um, when we're in Athens, uh, there are no microtones. But once we get to, to, uh, to Crete, as it were, that's going to mm. be incorporated as a way of differentiating the other from from what was going on in Athens. 
Um, so uh, that's come out of of looking at those mm. um, clips of, of music from um, the Balkans. That, and I think that actually, it's, it's the you know, notion of the dodal that started me thinking about. Oh well, this must be dodalus must go all through Balkan culture. Right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So it's because of his travel back or his travel No, there. because of the word, Daedalus oh, and Daedalus, yeah. the sense it's the same word that's for, for the maker. Um, and that sense that, yeah, I mean, well, huh, it's a still a geopolitical question. Where does Greece stop? Yes. Um, and also, that's also a historical question. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah absolutely. Alexander the Great was from Macedonia. Well, where? You know. Well, it's interesting to, I mean, you know, the myths start off in, 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 in Knossos, in, in Crete, and they clearly moved up to Mycenae by about 1200, 1300 BC. And then they must have crossed over to, to Athens by the time of you know, the, the great classical country. So we're talking 500 BC. Mm. And then made their way further up, up, the, um, up the Balkan Peninsula, as mm. it were. So, um, this, this is the story. The story, story yeah. Yes. Mm. And hence why, you know, over thousands of years, it, all these various versions have, have yeah. you know, proliferated. And Fiona, with, um, as a poet who's often translated poetry from lots mm. of languages, how has that affected your approach to this work? And uh, I, I have thought a lot about, because um, I, I tend to do co-translation, so collaborating with the original poet, um, in both directions actually being translated as well as translating, so it's a really detailed dialogue, and my experience is always that that's the best kind of translation because it's a form of close reading. You know, if you really interrogate a poem, or in, in my case, often the literal of the poem, I mean, word by word, you, you find out a great deal more about what's going on than assuming from... I mean, it's very... It's the exception who has a language to a literary level in two languages. Most people have a mother tongue and another language in which they might be fluent. Still not quite the same. Um, and it's particularly important for poetry. So that sense of close reading and of nevertheless the conclusion from that close reading being constantly a remaking rather than a, a photographing because you can't, because you know, there is in a sense no such thing as translation. I mean, you know, every every word in every language has a slightly different cluster of connotations around it, not only and also not to mention a different music, it sounds different obviously. Um, so, um, and actually working with, I think, a composer is, is sort of a bit like that. I mean, it, and this is the first opera I've worked on, and I've been wanting to work on an opera for a really, really long time, but I have had poems set before, and sometimes that's been a good experience, and sometimes it's been a bad experience, but it's been a good experience where there's been a sense of dialogue, at least a sense of dialogue in the work, and a sense that the composer is, because, because the words are chronologically prior, um, a sense that the composers ha composer has um, paid rigorous attention to the poem, but then hasn't tried to just do the poem on top of the poem. It's not just ekphrasis, but they've tried, they have chosen to make something alongside. It's a different thing, it's a new artwork. And I think translation works like that too. Mm. So this is a, starting from both a, a deep reading of the poem, but also then trying to think, how are you going to recapture something of that spirit? Yes, and, yeah, so you, and I mean, exactly. Sound. I mean, the debates in poetry translation are all around what that fidelity it is. Is it to the letter or to the spirit? And of course, mm. actually, it's a it's a word by word, case by case decision making process, which continue tries to find the absolute aha, the word that does it both musically and semantically, and culturally, and, and, and that's very hard. I mean, what you were saying about wanting recordings with the stresses of the, of the, of the original language, that's, that's also part of it, even though it's very unlikely that for linguistic translation as opposed to setting of words, you will be, you'll be repeating the, the, the metrical pattern or, or, or trying to you know, rarefy it. You still need to know how it works. You still need to know the clusters of sound, the, the rhythmic clusters, um, of course, whether it's strict form too, if, if it's a alphabet you don't know at all. For example, I've co-translated from Hebrew a word of, I can't read a word of that language, you know. Um, I only briefly mastered the alphabet and that's gone again, you know, by now. <laughs> um, so, 
Yeah, and Estonian actually also. Yeah, also a language where I find it very hard even to spot the verb in the in the sentence. So um, so leave alone, finding the sort of meter and, and the form in, in, in something. So yeah, so I've I've recognised that what you were saying about needing a recording of the original. Going on from that, I was interested in what you said about the music of language. And mm. What is it? What does music of language mean to you, mm. both as a musician and as a poet? Mm. Such an interesting question. I mean, I think it means lots of things. I mean, poets tend to say, as I said, oh, um, poem doesn't need setting it set to its own music. And um, by that, they tend to mean recognisable poetical forms, poetics like um, a particular metre, particular rhythm, rhyme, um, alliteration, assonance. But I, I remember when I was first started giving poetry readings, and I just had this aha, which was that this is so like playing a concert. You know, you aren't expressing, you are making the text communicate. You have stepped back from it. You must find this as a composer, that yeah. you know, you're not freshly composing as you're going along. It's not like improvising. You are conducting or performing a, something, here's something I prepared earlier, you know. <laughs> yes. um, and from that insight came sort of other things. I realized that, that both poetry and music were extended through time. They're chronologic arts, they're not synchronic arts. And, and I realized that both, you have this sense of building this kind of structure out into the dark space of the auditorium in just the same way. The sentences you're forming are doing it just as the phrases I used to play are. And so I realized that there are things that language and music have in common, that certainly poetry and music have in common, but I think all written language and indeed all spoken language. And one of those things is the phrasal breath. So um, I'm very aware that I can only write with a four stress line because I don't have a lot of puff. I can't actually master the authoritative five stress line, even though I like reading it. So it's not because I hear it as old fashioned. It's, I just can't say, it's not how I think, because I think how I speak. They're thinking quite a choppy up and down rhythm, and that's because I was a very bronchial kid. I don't have a lot of puff. And I think that that's probably true for all of us, that there's a reason that phrasal units are subject, object, verb, because kind of that's as much as we can say and hold in mind in one unit. I think there's something very fundamental about that in all languages, even languages, I don't know, like sort of Mandarin, which do different stuff around time, you know, they, and tenses and so on from us are very different grammatically, I still think there's a kind of phrasal unit. And there certainly is in the organisation of music, and there certainly is in the organisation of poetry, there's no question. And it's one of the things that traditionally the line form records. And then there are other things like density, how much is going on at the same time in a score, you know, obviously it's kind of visually a layer cake on the page, but it also orally is, of course. And language is like that too, you know, you can have two meanings going on, you can have um, nice semiotic stuff going on, you know, there's a lot of player sound going on, but particularly not so much in spoken stuff, in stuff that you read aloud, you know, written texts. Um, and what that density is for, and what it communicates by f sheer virtue of being dense. You know, when you read Geoffrey Hill, as opposed to when you read Caroline Duffy, there's an experience of density in the former, which some people detest and some people adore, but there's a different intentional thing going on which of course is quite related to high kind of high church Anglicanism and you know deep being deeply learned and a sense of the thickness of literary culture in England and a thousand and one things chromaticism you know the sense that some things are very I mean a color that um, Philip's been talking about a lot and talks about a lot with your poets is atavistic you know that's a kind of tonal thing it's to do with in language to do with, you know, not using too many polysy polysyllables, not using Latinate choices, but Anglo-Saxon word choices. It's to do with having lots of assonance, so the vowel sounds chime off each other, and so there's a kind of, a kind of um, a, well, an enhanced resonance, all those sorts of things. So there are all these things that go on in language that if only composers would remember to, in a sort of in a sense, think about a poem in musical terms, in baldly musical terms, and not just as, oh, what they have in common is song and song meter, you know, ballad form or whatever, but really get beyond that to the fundamentals, the very same things that you use when you are composing, I think would be very fruitful, and vice versa for poets. How do you see this collaboration um, moving in the next couple of years, as you come up to production? Um, 
I, I see more of what we've been doing, which is as I get to something, um, in a way, not checking, but making sure that uh, I'm getting every aspect of what you were thinking when you were writing the libretto the before I necessarily, you know, uh, commit once and for all, just in case, you know, there's, there's, a, there's obviously another way of looking at it, and I, I might have missed that. I think the other thing that's emerging is that um, when you're writing the libretto, you're thinking of, of, a, of a narrative structure. As I'm writing the music, I'm thinking of that narrative structure and also of a musical structure that's, yeah, that's so in counterpoint with it. Mm -hmm. So that, um, you know, I think the, the best, whether, whether it's a song setting or, or a, you know, a six hour opera, the, the best... Um, pieces of music that use words have music that has an independent life as well and, and those interact with the words but that independent life is like Bulevs would say you know is is contingent on the, on the um, on the poem as center and absence so even when the poetry is not there it's still informing everything you do in in the music it's making the music what what the music is but I I see us moving forward, I mean, you know, there, there are going to be practical things like dealing with the bits in Greek and, mm. and Cretan and whatever that we'll, we'll have to sort out when we, when we get to all those. But, um, but I think the, these conversations about characterization, um, even, if they, even if I end up confirming what I, I think, it's really useful to have had someone question mm. what, what I'm doing. Um, and actually for me too. I mean, I don't necessarily think the libretto shouldn't change, you know. Right. At the moment, I think of it as complete, but I wouldn't be averse to, you know. And the other thing that's, that's going to come in at some point is the dance. I mean, we're already starting to talk to people about, OK, so these are my ideas for the dance. How do dancers do that? Um, or can they do that, etc. So, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, um, we, we, we'd rather generically put the collo or the, yeah. the you know, the as, as, a, as a shorthand yeah. for the dance. But I, I'm thinking of, of dances that use pulse labyrinths um, so that, um, you know, what the dancers count um, changes in terms of length. Mm. Can dancers do that? Well, I've, I've started to have conversations um, with, with people about that, and they can do that. Um, the way they think about it is not how a, how a musician thinks about it, but they can do that. So that's going to be very interesting because that's, that's another angle that's going to come, mm. become more and more important. As, as we uh, continue through through the uh, the actual writing of the, of the well, piece. I suppose the original dancing for the right. I mean, I remember seeing the the uh, uh, kind of revival of the Diaghilev production of Les Nos um, in in Amsterdam. You know, in the whatever it's called, the Netherlands, whatever it is, <laughs> their premier company. Terrible thing to say. I can't remember. But actually, I thought it was dreadful because they they kind of they did kind of walk like an Egyptian, and they were wearing quite a lot of gear. There's kind of quite a lot of walking in profile and then walking in profile the oh, other way. Right. I didn't feel it was the... I felt the choreography has kind of come on since then, which is a terrible thing to say because that's one of the great, you know, but... But I've not seen the original of the right and I'd be interested to see that. Because obviously they're dancing, you know, it's, it's you know, at the end, it's the dance, you know, it's, it's three and then seven and then, you know, it's yeah, a sure. each bar. I mean, Okay, it's not a labyrinth, a pulse labyrinth, but they don't know that in a sense. All they, they do is they know is they've learnt the um, in, you know, inconsistencies. Yeah, sure. And also, I'm learning that dancers can dance in counterpoint to the music. So they're counting one thing and the music is doing another. So that's an, another interesting uh, angle that I hadn't actually considered. Yeah. So, so there's a lot for us both to learn, perhaps, yeah. in that yeah. respect and how that will inform the piece. And there's also an interesting thing about dance phrase rhythm can be very different in length to um, musical course. phrase rhythm. Yeah, yeah. sure, Which sure. Which is also very interesting yes, they thing. they haven't got to hold their breath, have they? Uh, the other thing I was thinking about, you, with these uh, things with the languages is uh, being translated at the moment. Mm. Especially interesting is you as a poet, you know, and, and what, how are you going to respond to the colour and the the sound and the music of the translated language and they're thinking, hmm, what do I need to <laughs> adopt or, or change or adapt to incorporate yes. the translation? I mean, one of the things I'm really, really aware of is, is, is the most basic thing, which is that they will, 
disrupt the meter mm. Mm. that I've written for this form. But, I mean, obviously having been used to being translated, that makes me in a sense able to relinquish those lines to that process perhaps more. Although perhaps it makes me more suspicious because I've had so many bad experiences of being translated as well as such good experiences that I'm much more... Maybe that's one of the reasons there are no speeches which are entirely in another language. Maybe I sort of think, you know, that would be to destroy the integrity because I suppose it is the case that just as the whole opera in a way will have a tone world actually for me the libretto even though I wrote it you know scene by scene and then act by act um, it's definitely a whole it's definitely a, an entity it's definitely a thing which I didn't expect necessarily like that would it would feel like that but it does I definitely feel I've made a text I've made a thing and um, Yes, I do have to be careful not to be... It's odd that I don't have any... I suppose it's because I know Philip, the composer now, and I know that I trust him, whereas, of course, the translators are unknown quantities, so I don't yet know whether I trust them. But, um, but I think that the disruption will be not as great as some of the radical refigurations that Philip's already done. Yeah, that's very with, true. You know, yes. <laughs> you know, my carefully balanced lines, which add up to, like a Shakespearean broken line, to a, a whole metrical unit, but... Oh, oh. <laughs> it's completely gone. Oh. And they're not there in the opera. <laughs> it's not there. But that's always an interesting yes. thing about when you have a poetic form and then you allow the music to expand beyond that. Absolutely. Yes, yes which is lovely. Yeah. I mean, you've put in a lot of repetition, but yes. I've put in even more. Yes. So, you know, um, yes. it's funny how music needs that, you know. Yes. Um, especially, say, you know, the opening scene where there is... It's so fast, and and the rhythms that you've got are really quite mm. fast, and it's, it's and there's quite a lot of not only repetition but kind of as it were you know rhyme and so on. So there's dead and Daedalus and Daedalus and Talos and yeah. you know that kind of chime through of which is not necessarily it's certainly not necessarily there in the same pattern. It'll be there because the words are there. But I have tried to 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 make something of of a lot okay. of that. It's like to us and Talos. Mm. Uh, and I've I've made plays on on that as well, right. you know. Okay. So it's in, again, it would be important that the singers get things very precise mm -hmm. so that those, you know, those plays can come can come out. 